Good morning and Merry Christmas. Today we are continuing our series, O oh, Come. Uh, the holidays, I, I don't need to tell you that Christmas is the best time of the year, but I'm going to tell you anyway, this is it. This is Christmas. We love this time of the year at Discover. Uh, we always enjoy celebrating the fact that God has come to be with us. We took a look at that last week. We took a look at what the meaning and the definition of the word come is, that it means for somebody to move into the presence of someone else. And we talked last week about how God recognized that there needed to be a change in position between where he was and where his people were. And that's what Christmas really is all about. We talked last week about the fact that Jesus came to be with us. Today, we're going to start a look that we're going to stay in for the rest of the Christmas season of how we are to come and behold him. Come and to the, to the manger scene, come to the, the Christ child and be transformed by him coming. Uh, and we're going to take a look at some of the great Christmas carols throughout this series and how they really accentuate that idea. Today, we're, we're kicking it off with, Oh, come, let us adore him. Very excited to be able to share this with you. Would you uh, take a few seconds now, though, and pray with me as we enter into this time of discovery over who Jesus is, not just at Christmas, but all of the time. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, thank you so much for your love uh, thank you for your incredible generosity. Lord God, you, you gave us the most ultimate gift when you gave us Jesus, when you, when you made a way for us to be with you. And Lord God, I'm just, I'm in awe of that. And I, and I love that we, we take a moment, we take a season to celebrate that. God, I pray this morning that you just would move in our midst, that you would utilize technology, you would, you would allow it to, to, to make us connected to each other. But more than my words connecting with our ears, Lord God, I just pray that you, Holy Spirit, would move in our midst and connect us to, to yourself, Father, that you would connect us to your message of love and your message of togetherness, and that we would be transformed once again by this incredible message. We gotta pray these things in your holy name. Amen. So where we start this morning is on our movement toward Jesus. As I said beforehand, we, we looked last week at how God came to be with us. I think it's crucial for us if we're gonna really celebrate Christmas and if we're gonna be transformed by it for the totality of our, of our calendar year, it's important that we understand, I think, a good uh, a picture of kind of the spiritual nature of where God is positionally and where we are. The very millisecond that we start engaging in self-destruction. For most of us, uh, it starts very early in life. Now, self-destruction, you know, we talk about this all the time. When we engage in self-destructive behavior, that's what the Bible calls sin. We start missing God's mark for what life should be. Uh, God has said, here's a course for life that I want you to take. And if you follow this, if you follow my leading and my guidance, I'm going to give you a life that is full and abundant. And that sounds pretty good. The only problem is we have this inherent bend to sort of say, no, I think I'm going to be the Lord of my life and I'm going to pull away from you, God, and I'm going to do my own thing. And that never works out right. No matter how much we might try to fake it, no matter how much we might lie to ourselves and say, yeah, it's working out fine, it never does. And what, what that behavior, that self-destruction does, is it creates a gap between where he is and where we are. And we have looked at how uh, that gap causes uh, this ultimate penalty of spiritual and physical death without some kind of a bridge to, to God's salvation and grace. Um, we're in trouble. 
We're, we're looking at eternity separated from him. And God, through Jesus, gave us this incredible gift, this Christmas gift, of saying, I want to connect to you. And so I'm going to, through Jesus, I'm going to be clothed in human flesh. I'm going to go to earth. I'm going to live a life. I'm going to go through tragedy and difficulty and hardship. But I'm going to show you, through that experience of life, how it can be done, how you can turn to the Father in everything, how you can let the Spirit of God guide you. I'm going to demonstrate for you, and then I'm going to go even beyond that. I'm going to then give up my perfect, blameless life as an atonement for you, so that you, if you choose, can also journey from where you are on the other side of that gap and find connection with the Father. That's why we celebrate Christmas. It's not as much fun as giving the presents are, and even as great as all of the food and celebration is, as nice as the family celebrations all are, that's all ancillary stuff. The real meat of this holiday, the real reason for it all, is because God made that way, and God came to Bethlehem, he came to humanity, and he said, here I am, connect with me, and I will walk through this life with you. But that wasn't, that wasn't something that he forced upon us. He said, it's a choice that you all get to make. I'm going to call you and say, I'm here. Then I want you to make up your own will of your own free mind, whether or not you want to also come, where you want to leave where you are, separated from me because of the selfish things that you have done, and come toward me. Come toward me and connect with me in a relationship. And that's the idea of Christianity. That's, that's what it all is. And so with regard to that, today what I want to take a look at is, is how that first step of coming from where we are to where he is, how it all plays itself out. And to do that, I want to take a look at some of the great figures that we always remember every year at Christmas. I want to talk first and foremost about Jesus' earthly parents, Mary and Joseph. Now you are, I'm sure, well aware that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, Mary and Joseph were, uh, they were, you know, kind of adopted parents for, for Jesus. I mean, Mary obviously gave birth to him, but she did that through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, so these, these two figures, Mary and Joseph, they, they play a very crucial role in Jesus' life, but it's a very unconventional role. Every year, you get the opportunity to kind of replay that and think about how that all works, right? You get that whole um, crash course, always from me, about how Mary and Joseph were really just, you know, kids. They were young people. They didn't have uh, any children before Jesus. They didn't have any kind of, you know, particularly great track record that, man, these were like the, the parents of the year. And, and when God was looking around for who can I find to, to kind of, you know, take care of, my son during the formative years of his life, you know, oh, Mary and Joseph, they're the obvious choice. Wasn't that case at all? Because uh, Joseph's probably 15, 16, 17 years old, right? I mean, he's not very old. And Mary definitely is, you know, 13, 14, 15. I mean, you know, they're young kids. They're just getting started. Now, it was, you know, 2,000 years ago. Culture was different. Uh, getting a start in life together would have happened uh, five or 10 years before we typically do it today. But they were just run-of-the-mill, normal kids. They had uh, become betrothed to one another, uh, like being engaged. So they were kind of legally looked at as a married couple. But in the spiritual sense, they hadn't gotten married yet. They hadn't consummated the relationship. They weren't officially husband and wife yet. When all of a sudden, God let it be known that he was coming into their lives if they would accept him. And in that, you know, sort of, of, of situation, we get a great portrait of how things can work itself out with us. Let's take a look. Let's do a little deeper dive. Let's take a look first at uh, what took place. I'm going to read to you from the, the text, the book of Luke, the second chapter, the, the first seven verses. These words, I'm sure, are very familiar to you, but let's take a look at them. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quinarius was governor of Syria. 
and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. I'm pretty sure you know that story. I'm pretty sure you've read it as many Christmases as you've been kind of kicking on this uh, rock hurtling through space that we call home. Now, here's, though, the thing that I want you to contemplate today. I want you to contemplate why you think it is that God set it up in such a way that not only did he come to this young couple who were just getting started and were really wet behind the ears and you know didn't really know what they were doing, not only did he come to those two people, but he came to them in this very unique moment when the, the government decide, hey, we're gonna do a census and we don't have the technological prowess yet to just send out some kind of an app on your smartphone for you to say, yeah, I'm alive. This is where I am and this is where I'm living and this is who I'm connected to at this point. No, he, God sets this whole thing into motion at a place, in a time, in a moment where it would require everybody, but particularly Mary and Joseph in this case, to have to get up from the experience of life that they're having and go or come to a different place. In this matter, in case we, the text says very specifically that Joseph is living in Nazareth, which, you know, we've talked about that before here at Discover. Nazareth was way up north, and he had to leave that place along with Mary and go down to Bethlehem, which we think of today, you know, if you look at a map, it's a little suburb of Jerusalem. But back in the day when there weren't cars and you were traveling on foot, it was a little far out to be considered a suburb, but you know, geographically positioned, if you're looking at a map today, it's not far from the, the center of Jerusalem. Back then, a little bit too far to be, you know, someplace that you would travel on foot, but it's, it's a journey. That's the big thing that you need to know. It's a journey from where Mary and Joseph were. I think it's not a throwaway detail. I think it's important for us to look to see that what God was doing there, was giving us a portrait that if we're going to go meet Jesus, we're going to have to kind of dust off um, our, our travel boots, both physically and spiritually, and we're going to have to move. We're going to have to leave the old pattern of life, even if it's something that, you know, we're going to return back to, you know, where we live, what we're doing, how, where we work, you know, who, who we're married to or who our parents are or who our kids are, who our neighbors are. Even if we're going to go back to that, to go to Jesus, we're going to have to, to break away from that for a minute and travel to, to where he is. I think it's really important that we, we kind of see that there's this connection here. So this happens, this moment transpires, this moment takes place where they get the marching orders. Now, even before they get those marching orders to leave Nazareth and go down to Bethlehem, we read also that Mary is expecting a child. I say this every year, but I want to say it again. Uh, that was not the cultural norm. Uh, you know, today it's unfortunate, but a lot of times uh, people don't wait to get married before a lot of things start happening, but even sometimes before children um, start coming into the picture in the scenario in the scene. Uh, that was really 2,000 years ago in you know, the Judean province, in the, the Jewish world, that was not, to use their term, kosher. That was not a cool thing at all. There would have been great awkwardness with Mary having um, already become with child. Uh, it would have been awkward with Mary's family. Um, and, you know, we play through this every year, but let me just re, you know, communicate this again this year. It would have been very awkward between Mary and Joseph. Thinking through that, they're pledged to be married to each other. That's not Joseph's kid. Joseph knows that's not his kid. He didn't get Mary pregnant. And then Mary comes back and says, hey, actually, uh, not only am I with child, but I'm with child and it's God's child. First thing you know, Joseph's going, yeah, right, it's God's child. But just if you unpack all of that stuff and you start 
looking at what transpires, God messages both Mary and Joseph and says, hey, look, this is what the father is wanting to do. He's wanting to close that gap. And he wants the two of you to be part of this idea that's going to enable all people who will ever live to be able to come to him, to, to have this relationship with him where um, they, this Holy Spirit of God will take up residence in their lives. And it's all going to be predicated on the coming of this child, Jesus. Would you come to him? Let me share with you about how that sort of plays itself out for both of them. Let's look at Joseph first. In the book of Matthew, in the very first chapter, we see how uh, that message gets communicated to him and then how the, the opportunity to respond plays itself out. The very first chapter, Matthew chapter 1, uh, verses 18 through 24. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, stopping there just for a minute, I, I'm pretty sure you can figure out what's you know, there between the lines, but just, just, just to make sure that you get this. Joseph loves Mary, clearly because he doesn't, at this point, decide to, to ruin her life. He doesn't look at her explanation and say, I don't buy it, I don't believe it, but we're gonna see here in just a few, few words as I continue the scripture that he didn't buy the whole it's coming from God thing. But at the same time, through his hurt and his clear sense that she's betrayed me, he still has this well of emotion for her, this, this care for her, this concern for her, and I would even go so far as to say this love for her, where he says, okay, uh, I still want to make sure she's taken care of. So I'm going to shoulder the burden. I'm going to divorce her quietly. Now, what does that mean? I think, arguably, it means that he was going, he planned on sort of taking the hit in public, let everybody think that he was the one who jumped the gun. And then after the fact, he would then divorce her and then People say, where it happened to Mary later on, say, I dismissed her, and he would take on the public shame. So he's doing the right thing. It's a beautiful thing that he's doing here, but make no bones about it. He is also at the same time saying, but I'm not going to stick around. I'm not going to subject myself to a life with this person after they've betrayed me, and I'm certainly not going to take responsibility for this kid that she's bringing in. That's not my child. I don't want anything to do with that child. They're going to be on their own. I'll be cool about the separation agreement, but there, make no bones about it, there will be a separation, whether she agrees to it or not. But then now this happens, verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will get, be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Then, very importantly, verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. Now, okay, let me just, let me just come back and, and hit on that verse, right? It says, when Joseph woke up, and that when is coming after we get the little clue to the prophecy that came back from actually the book of Isaiah. What's crucial that you realize about this is that the angel is the one who is giving that call back to Isaiah to Joseph in this kind of trance thing that he's in. So he is saying to Joseph, look, this is God's plan. This is what God wants to do. God wants to do all of this stuff. But, you know, here's this role that God has made way for you to play in this. And th this whole huge thing will be specifically so that Jesus can fix the gap 
problem between where humanity is and where God is so that Jesus can be that bridge so that people can cover that bridge and walk across it. But Joe, you're first. You're the first one who's going to have the opportunity to either do the right thing and come to Jesus or keep calling the shots and say, no, I'm not going to come to Jesus. I'm going to send him on his way. The text says that Joseph said when he woke up, no, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to walk uh, to Jesus and I'm going to Go ahead and follow the plan with, with Mary. Now, thinking about Mary, let's take a look at her issue and her story and how it all played itself out for her. We go back to the book of Luke. The book of Luke kind of, he, Luke took care of making sure that her story got recorded. We look at Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 34. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words <laughs> and wondered what kind of greeting that might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Again, let me just stop and make sure you see this. This is Mary going, whoa, ha, I have a whole life that I've, I've got in mind here. I've been planning a wedding. I've got this wonderful guy, Joseph. I'm ready for a life with him. I'm ready to be the mother of his children at some point. I'm, I'm wanting that experience. Thanks for the compliments, Angel Gabriel. I'm glad to know that I'm doing well in God's eyes, but that's not what my plan is, what you're outlining here. Uh, that's, that's, that's not what you know. I'm interested in doing, coming to this experience that you're describing with this little Christ child thing. But it says in verse 35, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who was said to be barren in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Last key verse here, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. So here you see Mary do the same thing that Joseph ultimately did. She hears the message of God and she contemplates what the messenger is saying. And talk about a, a, a horrible kind of, of alteration to your life. I mean, in this case, let's just call it, you know, let's, what it is and, and be honest. God is saying, Mary, I want you to do something that frankly, your world is going to look at you for and they're going to cast judgment upon you. They're going to make assumptions about your character. They're going to think less of you because of this. I mean, all of a sudden you're going to be walking around and you're going to be pregnant. There's obviously going to be, you know, the conversation to have with Joseph over all that and to convince him that this is, you know, from God and all that stuff. But what are you going to say to your parents? You're going to, you know, they're, they're planning this big party, this big wedding thing, and now you're going to come in and say, I'm pregnant. I mean, that's going to cause them to, to feel shame in their Jewish world. You know, what are you going to say to all your neighbors? What are you going to say to all your friends? What are you, how are you going to explain all of this, right? I mean, there's, there's all of that baggage that culturally she's going to have to carry in order to go to come to where Jesus is. But the prospect of having that gap closed, not just for all of humanity, but for herself, the prospect of, of the fact that the Almighty is saying, in you, I am so pleased, and in you, I, I want this something special. I want this connectivity. I want to, to, to build my kingdom up through who you are and what part you can play in this. But that Mary said, May it be what the will of the Father is here. I am willing to come. Now, you know what transpires next, I think, right? Let's go back to the book of Luke and let's see what happens as Jesus uh, comes on the scene. We go back to Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. It says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. 
an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. Here, it's so important. Again, you know this story, but a couple of things that you need to make sure that you're computing as you get all of these, these data points, right? The angels appeared to the shepherds. The shepherds, they take care of the sheep. Bethlehem was it was its importance 2000 years ago was that was where the flock of the sacrificial sheep that was owned by the temple in Jerusalem was kept uh, when people would come to make sacrifices and to do the main religious ritual of getting right with God they would come to Jerusalem and they would buy these these perfect blameless top of the you know condition sort of livestock to be able to offer up in a sacrifice so it was a big not only spiritual deal but it was a big financial money maker for the temple so this this herd was very important so the shepherds man they've got a big 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 job of protecting that herd and making sure that wolves don't get it making sure that you know pirates don't come in and steal them and making sure that you know and making sure that everything's good that the operation is taking place but additionally to that not only you know is there physical presence with those sheep needing to be constant because it's, you know, there's a lot riding on it, but being around those sheep would have made those shepherds ceremoniously unclean. Now they are operatives <laughs> or employees of the religious establishment. So these rules are going to always be key to them. They had to stay outside of the city. They couldn't come into physical contact with people uh, because their physical contact, because they were ceremoniously unclean, would make other people ceremoniously unclean. But because Jesus' role was to, in a permanent sense, give people that chance to be made right with God, those angels said, we're going to the shepherds. We're going to go to them because they have played this role with these, these temporary sacrifices. We want to let them know that they're appreciated as well, that they're time though is coming where they can come in and approach God and they can be forgiven for their sin because of what Jesus is going to do. So the angels show up there. Important that you know all that stuff. And then it's important that you see that and you understand the inference of language that when the angels say, hey, you're going to find this baby in this, this manger set up in this you know, barn outside an inn, what does that mean, right? Well, in a very literal sense, it means if, if you're gonna find Jesus, you're gonna have to get up and leave being out here with these sheep. You have to leave them alone, which is you know dangerous and against your principles of your job. And you're gonna have to go into town where you're not welcomed and you're not accepted. And you have to go find this baby, right? So you have to go, you have to come to Jesus. And when they hear all of this, they're going, uh, whoa. I mean, one, we're blown away that we're seeing this celestial night, you know, py pyrotechnic thing in the sky. But beyond that, that your message is for us to leave what we're supposed to do, culturally speaking, uh, even, you know, at, at great peril to our livelihoods. And we're supposed to go into town. But again, it's go to Jesus because this is who Jesus is. Glory to God in the highest on peace you know, to all. Mm, right? So what do they do? They get up and they go. Right? And they go with the sound of the angels glorifying God in their ears. It said, when the angels had left them, this is verse 15 in the second chapter. When the angels had left them and gone to the heavens, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They make that call. They say, we're going to do it. We're going to go. We're going to come to the, 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 the presence of the Almighty now coming to be with us on earth. We're going to go to this little manger scene and we're going to go find this baby because it's so much more than a baby. 
It's the movement of God coming to be with us. We are going to go now and come to be with him. So it's response to that. So, so they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. So they don't even say, we're going to go, but we're going to be quiet about it. We're not going to let anybody know that we're like moving toward Jesus because you know, there would be you know, a, a price to pay for that. Mm, you know, So we'll just keep it to ourselves in the DL. No. They say, we'll let everybody know. We left the sheep behind. There were angels, but you know what? Glory to God. Glory to God. We went, we saw with our own eyes, and we've been changed. And you know what? You will too. He's come to save us all. Glory to God. And all who heard it were amazed. But Mary treasured all these things up in her heart. She pondered them. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Gang, boom. That is what we need to do too. We need to, just like Joseph did, just like Mary did, just like the shepherds did, we need to hear the message this Christmas that once again, Jesus has come and that he's calling us to go to him. He's come to be here with us. He's calling us to go and be with him. And that may mean, you know, uh, rethinking what plans we had in store for this day or this week, this month, this year, this life. And saying, okay, I'm going to trust you enough that your ways are higher than mine and that your ways are the right ways for me to walk. And then I'm going to do exactly the same thing. I'm going to be obedient I'm going to respond to the message. I'm going to respond to the call. I'm going to go to Jesus. And then when I get there, I'm going to be transformed. I mean, that's why those shepherds sang. Those shepherds realized everything is different now. You know, in one way, ultimately, you know, not only could they have lost their job for leaving that night, but if everything was, was what Jesus, when his coming was what the angel was, was prophesying about there, they're going to be out of work just as far as like, you know, a, a livelihood going forward because Jesus becomes the sacrifice, right? But they didn't care. They didn't care at all because they knew that their spiritual souls, their spiritual existence, that was going to be elevated. And that was worth so much more because God had come to be with them. So they went and they adored him. They adored him. They glorified him. They praised him. Why? Because as it said, every time the angel came, he has come to save he has come to transform. He has come so that men might live from this point forward, men and women. He has come that all of us might have the opportunity to be with the Father and to know that saving grace, to be with the Father for all of eternity. So hark the herald angels sing, glory to God in the highest. Come and adore and praise him on bended knee. Here we are. Merry Christmas to us all. Let's do that today. Let's think about where we are and let's say, God, I, I hear your message once again. And I'm going to, to put down whatever it is that I'm doing, whether it's a physical thing that I need to put down or it's a spiritual or emotional thing I need to put down. I'm going to put it down and I'm going to move to you this morning. I'm going to move to you this afternoon. I'm going to move to you this week. I'm going to move to you this month. I'm going to move to you this holiday season. I'm going to move to you this life. I leave the lordship thing behind. I, I leave calling the shots, and I once again surrender to you. And I say once again, maybe you've never done it before. Maybe this is the first time that you need to do it. But either way, you say, God, you call the shots. God, you, you be in charge. God, I lay it all down. I want to come and find you and let you be God with me. And then I'm going to praise your name. I'm going to exalt you just like the angels did. I'm going to give glory to you for the transformation that you are going to do in my life. Would you come before him this morning and would you adore him? Let's pray. Father God, thank you again so much for the blessing of what you did. Thank you for coming Thank you for, for getting in our presence, in our place. But thank you also for the call to get in yours. Thank you for the call to, to leave uh, the, the 
circumstances and the situations that the well thought out or maybe not so well thought out plans that we all had beforehand. May we evaluate in this moment what's better, our plans or yours. If our plans are not the same as yours, God, I pray that we would see this morning that uh, there's a bright light shining over the place that you are. There's a star, there's a presence, there's a, there's a thing to follow. There's a way, there's a plan, there's a kingdom, and it's yours. God, I pray that we would come to that this morning. I pray that we would surrender who we are and just say, God, I want what you've got. I want what you are. I want that, that connectivity, that special relationship with you, and I want it to be the first and most important thing in my life. I want to give you glory. I want to adore you with all that I am. Thank you, Lord God. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Let's worship.